So uh, just to give you some time to think about your own questions, and when you're ready, please raise your hands, and the microphone will come to you. Um, congratulations on the film. This is really powerful. It feels really, really important. Um, Christopher, maybe can you start and give us a bit of context and how you embarked on that uh, journey in Philippe Robinoy and, and Barbie? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, good evening. So I grew up in Uganda, and my father was born in Uganda, so I have a Ugandan um, connection. I met Bobby and Barbie at the beginning of 2017 and I was familiar with Bobby's music at the time but when I met them I was just so astonished by them. I was astonished by their courage, I was astonished by their bravery. But Bobby at the time was an extremely successful musician. They had four beautiful, beautiful children and he had his beautiful, clever wife. And he was just embarking on such a treacherous journey that I just, it was like the script for a film. And when I started talking to them and they told me where they'd come from, what they'd done and what they were embarking on doing, I asked them if they would mind if we followed them. And we ended up doing that um, for five years. And I thought we were making about a film about a musician who went sort of slightly into activism, but it turned out, as you can see, to be something so much more. The other thing which was incredible about them, they just gave us complete and utter access. There was no point when they ever said to us, please turn off the camera. However awful things are, however stressful it got, they just always allowed us to carry on. They had nothing to hide. And um, the big difficulty with the film was turning literally thousands and thousands of hours into under two hours, and that was um, it was quite a challenge. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Barbie, can, can you tell us um, what it meant for you to have to have the film made, and maybe to have a film crew made with you very often? Thank you very much, um, Chris. Uh, is God sent? And having Chris come into our lives at a time when we needed the world to know what we were entering into was more than a miracle. Today is Chris's birthday. Chris <laughs> <laughs> was born in Uganda on Uganda's Independence Day. Wow. <laughs> his father was born in Uganda and his family built a hospital where I was born. <laughs> so we were meant to meet each other either way. <laughs> so I'll ask everyone to sing for Christian. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Chris. Happy birthday to you. are here and that our lives are being shown to the world and that the people of Uganda's voices are being shown on a bigger stage. So Chris just did a good job and we are grateful for his life. I'm sure you've got many questions. So please, uh, oh, there is a question at the front. So the microphone is coming on the server. Soundtrack to the film is available because it's an amazing soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, um, I can ask that. Yeah, there will be. Um, we've actually been putting together a soundtrack for the film. We just need Bobby to um, make sure he's completely happy with it. And the, but the, when the film comes out, there will 100% be a soundtrack to the film. Yeah. And also, you should listen to all of Bobby's music. It's incredible. <laughs> 
Uh, first of all, wow, that was a very powerful film, and uh, thank you, everybody who participated in it. As I was watching it, the thing I kept, I was kind of like expecting like everybody to be killed and disappear, you know, like a complete, total, extreme situation. And what was really kind of disturbing was the way that it was like swinging between seemed a bit free but then just when you got anywhere close to anything you'd be shut down but it was kind of secretive could you say something about the the modus operandi or that you feel is in place in terms of that form of oppression because there are many different forms of oppression but but it's quite specific and i think you captured it very well in the film this this sort of it wasn't hard to pin down but at times it was it was you could see how maybe the outside world could go, well, it doesn't look that bad, but then it is. Um, we have, like all dictators, the dictator in Uganda is smart. He is inclined on staying in power at all costs. He uses the primitive and the new ways of torture, and uh, so he uses them in equal measure. He will make you feel like right now you're free to do your work, but then he will leave the trap just ahead of you and get hold of you and create the most pain you've ever felt. Um, some of the things they do to torture us are visible, some are not. For example, they use Pegasus to follow our phone calls. They know who we are talking to. They know where we are. That's the world never gets to see unless somebody does some behind check and then comes and says, these phone numbers are tapped by Pegasus and I have everything. They have these primitive ways of following us. They have this Boda Boda, which is a motorcycle, we call them Boda Boda at home. There's this person following you everywhere you go. And you know them, that those ones are spying on you. They tell them where you are, who you saw, what you're doing. They have, they're in schools torturing our children from there. Then there are these others where they will be speaking to your people, the people around you, they bribe them. Can we give you some money and sort you out so that you just leave that guy to do the things alone? He is putting you in trouble. Some the world sees, some the world doesn't know, but he is always busy and he is working every day. But the people won't let that happen. They will keep pushing. That's why you see them when they captured everybody on the campaign trail. They took a hundred and something people into custody. The next morning, there was a group of young people willing to come to that same trail and move on with their campaigns. So um, they are not giving up. We are not giving up until you can answer free. I just, yeah. <laughs> I just like to add something to that. We, um, we filmed a huge amount of people who have been tortured, and we filmed people who have been tortured in a medieval way. We filmed people who had their fingers removed. We had filmed I just when, just horrific, horrific stuff. And we actually, in the editing suite, we were editing for two years, we made a decision that we didn't want this film to just be a catalogue of horror, and it could easily have been a catalogue of horror, to the extent when Bobby saw it for the first time, he said, you've made them look quite good. And we, we thought that the film would be far more effective and it would be a better platform for Bobby and Barbie and all the wonderful Ugandans if we showed it through their eyes. And just seeing endless torture, it's so horrific, but it's not as powerful as understanding the pain through people you get to know in the film and you end up loving in the film and it's far more effective and we just hope that but just believe me what's going on in Uganda is just horrific it's really horrific uh, if, if I could add a little bit on what Chris said we still have abductions happening they find young people our supporters leaders elected they get them they take them for more than two weeks and we demand for them publicly. They never say they have them. When they come back, they have scars, they have broken skulls, they have broken arms, limbs. They can't walk on their own. So the abductions are happening. Given yesterday, 
a leader called Mahmoud was abducted. We have a Ugandan journalist working with the BBC. His, her whole family was abducted, a family of seven. Because they can't get her, she lives outside of the country. They would rather cause the pain by abducting her family. They're intimidating her to stop reporting this to the rest of the world. So yeah, it, it's bad what is still happening home and the world should know. Um, <clears throat> yes, please. Thank you. My question goes to Barbie. Um, Barbie, thank you so much for everything. We've watched a lot, but I just want to ask you, a mother, a wife, I mean, someone who stands in for the girl, child, and everything. What is the source of your strength? Where do you get the daily, daily ability and energy and strength to keep moving? What's the source? What's the secret? Thank you very much. I have been trying to look for where my strength come from, comes from. And I just realized that it comes from the Lord. Amen. What happens to us and what happens around us is beyond human understanding and being able to wake up every day and face it over and over again and then smile genuinely and then uh, do it is it's just a strength from the Lord. And the other thing is, I am just an image of the many women who are going through worse things. We all know that there are women whose husbands were captured, who don't know where their husbands have been for three years. Their children are dead. And um, they, they are going through worse things than mine. So when I wake up every day, I am like, well, we are in this struggle together, but there are those who are suffering more than I do. And if I have the chance to stand and speak for them, I can't start walking backwards. I have to stand there and speak for them. So the other thing which gives me the strength is because I, I know that I need to speak for more women going through more worse things than I do. the land of Gandhi, uh, so I was quite surprised to see a non-violence being preached, uh, as Bobby White was mentioning. Uh, I, I know many intelligent people will ask many intelligent questions. I have a very trivial one to ask here, though. Uh, India is a developing country, and we at times have, we are divided into different states, and we also face corruption to some level, some at federal level. Some. So we just want to understand how people of India can specifically help people of Uganda in this situation. Uh, I think uh, it's been eye-opener. I never knew that Uganda is facing such issues. So I would like to know specifically if some action point can be drawn from people from India. Okay. <laughs> I, will, I will briefly and then you will finish that. So Uganda hosts a big community of Indians. Every little part of Uganda that you go to, you find an Indian shop. You find an Indian living within the community. They were born there. They have married within their communities, but they've been there. They speak our languages. They are one of us. What I have noticed, in my opinion, I, am, I can be corrected if I'm wrong. What I have noticed is they do not feel like they are part of us because they don't stand with us when we need them. We see them when the president is giving them free land to have their businesses constructed there. We see them when they're going to the president to offer him support and he has things to do. We don't see them speak when human rights of the people who are their customers are being abused. So we just need Beginning with the Indian community in Uganda, we just need them to highlight the plight of their people because they are one of us. We may have different skin colors, but they are one of us. They are true Ugandans, and if they could only speak 
and rebuke whatever is wrong back home. That would be enough. That's all I would need from you. I think this film would be hugely motivating for many other countries in Africa. I work on elections in Mozambique. I, I want people in Mozambique to see this film. How do we get this to Africa? How do we get this onto the web in Africa? Nobody could pay to, for the rights for this in, in Mozambique. And yet the, the opposition needs to watch this film. How do we do that? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, everyone said, you know, who were you making this film for? I think we were making it for two people. One, we've been very disappointed by Western governments. What typically happens is you have these fraudulent elections. They happen in America, England, the EU, everyone comes out and says, you know, that was totally flawed. There was no, as you saw in the film, there was no people monitoring the election at all. And then every, the governments come out and then within a month, it's business as usual, we're, we're back square one. So one thing we wanted to do was get a Western audience to realize what their governments are supporting and that it's not, it's not right. And then secondly, very importantly, we want to give Africans hope. And in Bobby and Barbie, you have two true African heroes. I was in Zimbabwe not so long ago and I was talking to a very prominent Zimbabwean there and he said um, he met Bobby and he said, I think I've just met the man who's gonna change Africa. I think these guys have the ability to have a massive impact on Africa. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure Africans can watch this film. I'm sure there'll be a lot of resistance. Um, obviously, the, the regime in Uganda has a lot of friends and they'll do everything they can. But it's very, very difficult to stop films getting out. And as much as you try, um, you know, people have ways of watching it. And I, I, I think this film, you know, it might end up being, you know, in markets or whatever. But if people want to see something, they, that they see it. But we will, I and mean, we've thought about various ideas about doing tours and going round and showing it to people who wouldn't normally be able to see it. I mean, nothing would be give me greater pleasure than, you know, having a truck and going through Mozambique and showing it to as many people as possible. And all that sort of thing is, is um, would love to do that. But yes, it's, it's more important for Africa than it is for the West because it's a film about them. <clears throat> Thank you, First Lady. I call you First Lady because you're my First Lady. Amen. Amen. My name is Lynn Sharps, and uh, I really, really want to appreciate the fact that you're looking after our president and the first daughters and sons. But uh, all these things that are going on in in Uganda, the West sees whatever is happening. And uh, I remember that uh, I think one of the things that removed Idi Amin on power is because they had put a limit on him so that he couldn't travel anywhere, he couldn't get anything. But still, back home in Uganda, the, the Western people like the ones who are supporting who are funding the dictator are still funding him what are you going to do because this film is a film that can really really maybe open eyes of other people because as i've heard my other brother who said that he has never known that that such a thing is happening in uganda but then how are you going to make sure that this western countries try to put sanctions onto the people that are causing a lot of trouble because they know them but they still find them thank you so much my lady and thank you so much guys thank you um crystal i don't have that say because uh, chris is from here and it is his <laughs> success that, uh, <laughs> it is his success that are being given out to the people in uganda so everyone here in this audience 
is a mouthpiece. Yeah. Every one of you has a platform. Yeah. Every one of you, whatever you do to make sure that this message goes out should be counted. And you should trust in the power that you have. We want you to be messengers. Go and speak to decision makers. That's the only way we will manage to stop this. <coughs> we have a group of Ugandans here. I truly appreciate the work you do. You know we have sanctions against most of the, of the generals, the military <coughs> generals. It was your work. You went and knocked at the doors of decision makers and those people have been sanctioned. They can't come to these places. That's small work you should do. That's why we believe in the diaspora. That's why we really look up to you. That's your duty to do. While we go at the front line, we expect you to do that part. We will just call on everybody. We will spread the word as far as it can go and hope that the right people will hear it and do the right thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's completely right. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, when someone's been in power for 36 years, there's a lot of business interests. And I know the British government have a lot of business interests in Uganda. Yeah. And it's, um, it just makes it, you know, it, their will's not in it. You know, the, um, America funds um, the, the Ugandan government well over a billion pounds, the EU gives them a billion pounds, and the UK, I'm not sure of the exact figure. A trillion, but it, just about five days ago. Yeah, but so, so what ends up happening is they'll give regimes like Museveni's regime money on the condition that they'll send 6,000 troops to the AU to fight in Somalia, mm -hmm. or they'll, so they're doing stuff, mm -hmm. and Museveni's very good at that, they're doing stuff which the West wants them to do. But the fact that 44 million people are oppressed doesn't really come into their calculation. So it's really up to you. I mean, you know, I, I kind of feel we've done what we can and it's really up to public because it's your taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry, there is a question in the kind of fifth row, just here. Yeah. No, no, that's the first one. That's the other 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 one. That's um, question, quick one, is should we expect uh, the People's President Party 2? Um, before, before that answer comes yes. up, this is a quick note. Um, Ugandans who are here, please, when there is an activity of demonstration or whatever, please turn up. Even though you three people are there, you come, it makes a difference. Indigenous British uh, UK citizen, please, as the first lady advised, talk to your MPs. You know, uh, sensitize them so that they can speak to, they can work together with APP, all party, all party or group, so that they can work and such questions. Because what is happening today? Ask them why they signed. signed this election was, was the cheated, was, was stolen. But today, the MOD is signing another agreement to train soldiers in Uganda to do what? Yes. To kill Ugandans. You know, now we have a Putin, a black Putin. We have a Pinochet, a Pinochet, a Pinochet in Uganda. This is a black face Museveni must be stopped. Because what has done in the Great Lakes Done told. It's unbelievable. Thank you very much. So much to say that. Sorry. Thank you. No, there's um, no plan at the moment to do another one. We've, we've sort of been working on this for almost six years, and um, we'll just, you know, we'll see what happens in the future. So, um, can we just have one more question? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we get this gentleman here then? Uh, thank, thank you, and for your bravery as well. It's uh, just amazing uh, what, what you've done. And, you know, and, and just, stop, I suppose, on that, um, it's sort of quite a, a bleak ending in a way to the film uh, because of the election uh, that was sold them. Um, so, sort of what is next? And, and how are you galvanising um, opinion and, and all the opposition and people in in Uganda? And you've talked a bit about, which I part of what I was going to say about how to um, uh, what's the request of the uh, of the West. But is there any is there anything more that you think that the government uh, should be doing um, that you could add to that? What you've said already. And, um, and I personally will, I know some MPs myself, and I will raise this with members of the, some members of the foreign, uh, of the um, uh, parliamentary search committee. Yeah, I, I would just, I uh, pass over to Bobby, but I would just, uh, I, I'm responsible for the bleak ending of the film. So I was just quite, <laughs> and Bobby said, um, you know, you've made it so depressing at the end. Because Bobby and Bobby are both massive optimists. And I said, it, it is depressing, you know, you, went through all that, there was so many people abducted, there was so many people tortured, there was so much horror that went on. You can't, you can't get to the end of the film and say, it's okay, because it's just not okay. So I think, I, I hope it wasn't too depressing at the end, and I think with these guys, it's never too depressing, because they're such optimists. And throughout making the film, I just always expect Bobby to be killed. I, and I remember my wife saying to me, are you prepared for that? And I said, I'm not prepared for that at all. But it was always a possibility. We just knew that at any moment, that might be the end. And he's very much alive. And he's going to be so. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you for your question. What do we need the Western world to do? First of all, it's for them to recognize that Uganda has a problem, and the problem is the dictator who has stayed for more than 30 something years. years. Close to 40 years. Um, the Western world gives Museveni money. It's that money that he uses to buy the guns, to buy, to train the soldiers, to buy the tear gas. Every brutal activity you saw on the TV, or that screen is the activity done using the money that the Western world gives him. You may package the money as money for building hospitals, but we have the sickest health system in Uganda. You send money to build schools and to educate our children. Now we have less than 70% of children going to school currently. You may send the money to build roads, but you do not want to drive on Ugandan roads right now. You send money for whatever reason, it never does exactly that what you send him to go and do. So what we request is, if you are to give Ugandans money, we don't say don't bring it. We say, give it to the beneficiary. Follow it to the dot. Don't just hand it over to the protesters of this world. And please, Plus, uh, give them sanctions. They work. Mm. They work because this is where they come for for medication when they're sick. Yeah. yeah. Give them sanctions. They don't build hospitals home mm -hmm. because they know that they will jump on the plane, mm. chatter it, sit in it mm. alone, and mm. come here and get first class treatment. Yeah. Give them sanctions. Let's see where they will go for treatment. That's true. So we just need you to not support them mm. in all ways. Mm. I can give. I can give an example of the EU Parliament. Recently, they refused the, the pipeline, the oil pipeline, to go on. We are building a pipeline from our country through to Tanzania. But there are things that the EU demanded. Respect human rights, and then you can continue with this pipeline. Make sure that the climate is, and the, the, the environment is safe for people living next to this pipeline. All those things were not put in consideration. So they said, we are not giving you this grant because we need you to first make sure that these things are in place. Human rights are respected. We need to be convinced 
that the people of Uganda are happy with your government. And second, make sure that the environment, nature, and the climate are respected. But do you know what our president is saying? He's saying, to hell with what you're saying. The pipeline will go on. He is not saying, oh yeah, I may be faulty, we need to improve in those areas. No, he is adamant. So we just need the government here to give preconditions for every little coin that comes home. Bring home the money, but follow it up. Yes. to all the producers. Um, is there any chance that you could actually make some arrangements to um, show this on some of the uh, Ugandan uh, development partners, like for instance, like the um, European Parliament or the UK Parliament or even the, um, the Senate in America? Uh, if anyone here uh, is a lawmaker, if they reached out to you and actually they requested you to uh, make such arrangements, is that something that, uh, that will be possible? <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, very much so. Okay. Yeah, no, we'd, um, we would, so I, I, I don't know if you probably realize from the screen, but the film has been acquired by National Geographic Disney, which is fantastic. Um, it means the film's going to be seen by a huge amount of people. And we're just beginning to talk to them about other things we can do, but it, exactly what you said. Um, I think that's super important. And I'd also love to do things like screenings at Harvard, screenings at, you know, SOAS, screenings that would be really good to get um, lots of young university students to see this film and, and bring the situation in Uganda onto their radar. But yes, that's what we want to do. Yeah, I, I, I just think that our situation is so um, is so irrelevant compared to what these guys have been through, so I'm really not thinking about myself at all. Um, my co-director, Moses Boeo, um, showed extraordinary bravery. Um, he was often right on the front line during the election, and he's actually in America at the moment applying for asylum. So that just shows you, you know, if you are going to do, um, if you're going to speak out, you are, you are going to be in danger. But, um, you know, I, I'm not really concerned, I mean, I should be, I don't know, but I'm not really concerned about myself, but I'm concerned about all those people. Very much so. I mean, are we sort of, that's a really good question. <laughs> there would be, I think there'd be absolutely no chance of um, Moses getting inside of the UK. Why? I just don't think, I think, uh, I, I just don't think our current government is very susceptible, is very accommodating, um, particularly at the moment, for people like Moses. I think the Americans are far more accommodating far more acceptable. Um, so, you know, that's how it is at the moment. Yes. <clears throat> 